We're now very honored to be joined by Senator Joe Manchin, a Democrat from West Virginia. Uh, you know, West Virginia is typically referred to as a red state, uh, yet in a strong testament to his hard work on behalf of his constituents and his no-nonsense focus on reaching bipartisan consensus, Senator Manchin has consistently seen electoral success in West Virginia. Before serving in the Senate, Senator Manchin was a member of the West Virginia House and Senate for nearly two decades. Uh, he won the 2004 gubernatorial election by a large margin, and he was reelected by an even larger margin in 2008. In both years, it's important to know that the Republican uh, presidential candidate at the top of the ticket won uh, West Virginia uh, at the same time that Senator mm -hmm. Manchin was winning. Uh, he's been serving in the Senate since 2010 when he was elected in a special election to serve uh, the remaining term of the late Senator Robert Byrd. Uh, he was then elected to serve a full term in 2012 and reelected again into the Senate in 2018. And again, this was at a time when the Republican candidate, in this case, uh, Donald Trump, uh, won West Virginia quite handily. Uh, Senator Manchin, of course, has been at the forefront of many important policy debates in his time in the Senate, gun control, broadband, China, di disaster relief, just to name a few that come to mind. And now Senator Manchin is the incoming chair of the Energy and National Natural Resources Committee. Um, as you can tell, he's known for charting his own political course based on what uh, he believes is the correct policy result. He's known for reaching out to all senators, Republican, Democrat, Independent, to build a bipartisan consensus. We're going to hear about his priorities as the new chair of the Energy Committee. It's very important to real estate. We have a robust uh, agenda there, Senator. We're, we're quite interested in energy and, and climate matters, building codes, the electric grid, incentives to help defray uh, highly energy efficient equipment for buildings. But I think that in reality, before we do that, there are some mega issues that are currently before the Senate or about to be before the Senate. For example, first of all, there's a kind of a stalemate, unless you reach one today, regarding power sharing in the new 50-50 Senate. Uh, of course, there's the coming impeachment trial and uh, dealing with President Biden's cabinet nominations at the same time. But perhaps we can start with your views on the current state of the country, the health and the economic fallout from the continuing pandemic and where we go from here. Yesterday, it's in the news that you, uh, you basically were the leader in bringing together a bipartisan group of senators to talk with the new Biden administration officials about uh, a new COVID relief bill. And I'm hopeful that you can share some of your thoughts and reaction to that call, where we might be going. We're all very concerned about uh, the state of, of people who've lost their jobs, businesses that have been closed, businesses that want to be reopened but are concerned about liability when they do reopen and a host of things. So if we could start there, Senator, and thank you so much. You've got so many friends with the Real Estate Roundtable and people that we're familiar with. Uh, so many send their regards. Norm Brownstein, one in particular, of course, who sends his regards and, and others. So thank you again. and and and. Please share with us your thoughts on, on, on things right now. Thank you. Well, Jeff, there's a lot going on. So thank you for having me. I appreciate it very much. It's always good to talk to all my friends. And and uh, and you guys have your uh, finger on the pulse. You see it sometimes before it happens. You see what's going on. Uh, so let's just start where we are today. It's been, what, not quite uh, a week now. Uh, since the president, our new president got sworn in, was it last Wednesday, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken? And there's an awful lot that's happened. Someone says, how do you feel? And I said, well, I was sitting there. I was very proud of our country to come through what we've come through, the challenges that we have, and still see that transfer of power the way it has always been for 240 years. But one word was relief. I just could take a deep breath and think, okay, we're, here's, we're, here we are again. Now, it's up to us to make sure that we don't get back to any situation which is as dark as what we came through the previous two weeks before that when the Capitol was attacked. But then also we have to make sure that we're listening to everybody. How do you have 60, 70 million people that would vote for former President Trump knowing uh, his beliefs and his thoughts? What was he saying that 
makes that many people feel they were uh, committed or supportive? And what is the Democrats not saying that gives them comfort for being, you know, coming together more? So there's a lot of questions and we should evaluate that. You just can't say, well, we won and they lost. No, if we don't get this right, we all lose. And we saw how close we come to losing everything. So I think there's those of us who are committed to working hard, Jeff, across the boards, listening to people more uh, and trying to prevent any of that from happening, start healing our country. I really believe that Joe Biden is the right person, right place, right time. There's nobody that I know in the country today that has the experience level to understand how Congress works, especially how the Senate works, the compromises that have to be made, reaching across the aisle continuously and understanding the minority. And that's the whole purpose of the Senate. It gives power to the minority, which is basically our, our framers of our constitution, what they intended and the founding fathers. So since uh, Lyndon Johnson, no one's ever had a grasp of the Senate the way Joe Biden does. And Joe Biden has always been a bipartisan way. And Joe Biden said through the campaign, I didn't win. He said, I've had every progressive running against me. So what we have to do is make sure that that moderate middle is a safe place for him to be with legislation, not thinking he has to go too far left or people are concerned. So the first volley of things we've seen coming out, I think, was basically uh, recognizing the support that he had from progressives. But with that, understanding that they're going to have to understand that we're not going to be able to govern from the left. We can govern from center left. We can govern from center right. And we can govern from govern from the center, but not from the extremes, Jeff. And that's what we're trying to show that we can work. So you asked me about, let's just say yesterday afternoon, football games are on, the Packers are there, and uh, we were rooting for the Packers, but uh, you know what? They got outplayed. Uh, the, the best team won that day. It was the Buccaneers. And uh, Brady was a better quarterback than Aaron Rodgers that day of yesterday. Uh, I still support, we'll continue to root for the Packers because they're like, they're like a republic. They're owned by the fans. Our government is owned by the people. So it kind of gives me a, a, a tie to them, to the Packers. But with all that being said, um, we had a great conversation. Uh, as you know, President Biden's come out with a very aggressive plan of what he wants, and he came out with a 1.9. Well, we just went through, what, two or three months of deadlock. We couldn't get anything. Republicans were stuck at 500. Uh, Democrats wanted one point, wanted two, or no less than 1.8 or 2.3. They came down to 1.3, wouldn't go any lower. We've been deadlocked for two months. And after the election, I called Susan Collins and congratulated her on her win and said, Susan, we're in big trouble right now. Something's got to be done. And the reason for that, Jeff, is because everything was, 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 was expiring. Basically, it was running out in December and we were going to have an emergency on our hand. People that would be evicted, people that had no unemployment, had no money whatsoever. Food assistance is basically the, the basic necessities of life. were going to expire for an awful lot, millions and millions of people. So we stood as a bipartisan group. There was eight of us that started, had a dinner at Lisa Murkowski's house, started talking on what we could agree or not agree on and start moving from there. Once, once we were able to understand that this is an emergency, that's all we're dealing on. We're not dealing on policy matters, nothing. That's part of, that's a legislation process. We're dealing on what the emergencies we have to keep people uh, alive, if you will, basically alive and to get people through this pandemic that we have right now economically and keep it from, from collapsing. Senator, if I, if I could just interject sure. for just a second, I really was remiss in not thanking you for the work from last year, beginning back in March and April in the, in the original CARES Act, and then you know struggling through the year to finally get what you got uh, done at the end of the year because you identified rent people need to pay their rent and it's not just because building owners need it but owners need to pay their obligations and it goes on through the chain and and businesses need we help. made sure that jeff too that there would be money rolling back to basically the landlords and the people that have because they have mortgages to pay 
Yeah. You know, we just can't leave people hanging out there. They have to keep this thing alive. Well, and and really, I think uh, the other thing that I should have mentioned really was was so critical when near the, I guess, right after the election, perhaps when you and others in the no labels and the problem solvers group came together to try and get a bicameral bipartisan approach. And many of those thoughts basically were what was in the final bill. And perhaps we wrote a bill. We wrote the bill and gave it to them. And, and maybe they used the bill. About, they too. I mean, they used about ninety percent of that bill that we put together, and the only thing they couldn't come to an agreement on is they wanted the the, the, the liability, as you know, you know, for, uh, and we we're concerned about that too. And there were people that on the Democrat side were very adamantly opposed to liability, and the Republican side was very adamantly opposed to state and local uh, assistance more. So we had two things that we could not get our group together. So what we did is we agreed on everything 75% or 80, took that that we didn't agree on and put it by itself in a separate and moved from there, which is what you're going to have to do if you're going to move it. Don't let the whole ba throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's get what we do agree on. And that's how we're approaching this new, this new 1.9 trillion. Uh, Jeff, people have to understand, we've put almost $5 trillion out in less than one year, $5 trillion. We're right on the breach of $28 trillion of debt. We've, we've accumulated more debt faster in the last four years than ever. Since basically a quarter of our, of our GDP, I guess, is what oh. it would be. And basically, if you look at it, uh, accordingly to the, the, the World War II, uh, have we ever accumulated, how we were trying to survive back then. So we've now got to get, there's got to be some structure to it. All we were doing in the, in the questions we had last night, we had a good conference. Uh, uh, Brian Deese uh, was there. Uh, Louisa Terrell was on there. And Brian Nim and Nimbus was there too. And they basically just, uh, they gave an outlook of how they came up. I says, explain to us how you came to 1.9. We can explain to you how we got 900 billion before. And it was based on emergencies that were needed. We've been able to, 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 I think, suffice and cover those emergencies through March of this year. Now this is January and this is an emergency again, or is it something in long term? So we were trying to get the gist of where they're coming from on one nine, went down item by item. They followed up today and gave us some more. So we're evaluating that. And hopefully that we can have something that we feel that we can give them feedback of something we think will work well. And maybe there's a compromise. Well, that makes, it seems to make total sense, see where the gaps are of those who have not been uh, received assistance. And obviously there are a lot of gaps and then those need to be filled. Maybe state and local is one of them. I don't know how you feel about state that. State and local has to be on a need basis. There's an awful lot of states that are doing better today than they were before the pandemic. And, and there's all the states that got really hit hard with the pandemic are doing worse. But I think they recommended $350 billion in that neighborhood for the $1.9 trillion package. Um, both Democrats and Republicans are having a hard time grasping with that number since we couldn't even get agreement on $160 billion. Okay? Now to double that and saying this is what's needed. We hadn't seen that before and we haven't seen it now. So, but again, I, I reemphasize it has to be based on need, Jeff. What is the need? And you can't let it, you can't let a state like New York, who got ravished by this horrible pandemic, or Chicago or Illinois, and we and and we can't let politics play. Oh, that's a red, that's a blue state. Uh, that's just bad management. That's crazy. The bottom line is, is we have to look at the need, this where it's needed to help the American people and help our help the states. And sending money to every state, that didn't that doesn't work, Jeff. Just saying, I'm going to send every state money. Well, I know that you're you're a very optimistic senator. If you had to guess, would you do you see a bipartisan approach coming together? And do you think it might be done in the first quarter, first couple months? Sure. Or well, we, we're going to look at basically what expires in March the 14th. That's when unemployment. We're going to make sure that the people that can't go back because the pandemic is still flourishing and the uh, vaccines aren't out the door yet, Jeff. So we got to make sure that people that have no jobs to go to because the businesses are still closed will get unemployment checks. So you'll see that that a compromise will be made.
I can assure you on that. Yeah. Uh, the other things that need it, vaccine, whatever it takes. I think they want $160 billion for vaccine distribution and all the things that need to be done to support us being able to vaccinate people. We don't have a bit of problem with that. Whatever it takes to get, get people vaccinated, we will do. Well, it is amazing uh, that the vaccination process has sort of stumbled a little bit in many, many states, but it hasn't stumbled in your state, sir. And, and uh, yep. it's gone very well in West Virginia. So people know, so all of your people know, and I've, I've been able to dig into this a little bit. Uh, this is not a distribution problem. This is a production problem. We did not have the amount of product, whether it be from, uh, from Moderno or Pfizer, and now you have Johnson Johnson will come on pretty soon. We did not have the product that we thought we had or we were told we had from the present, from the, uh, uh, yeah. well, that's from the Trump good. administration. They were telling us that they, from the former administration, we didn't have the product, Jeff. We just didn't have it. So rather than go back and harp on that, that we were told to lie or we were misled or whatever, forget about it. Let's take what we got right now. Yeah. We know that we can give limited doses because of, of production. We can distribute whatever they give us. And I'm telling people today, you won't, see a you won't see an increase in vaccinations state by state as far as in what you're getting right now in allotment on a weekly basis until probably in February. And you'll see that ramp up pretty rapidly from February going into March. You're going to see it really go because we're, we're getting we're, we're the production. Defense Production Act, we're really pushing some things out. I, I uh, commend the uh, Biden administration. Don't harp on the past. Just fix it. Get more production. That's a great attitude, Senator. I know your time is, is really, I, I just want to ask you one other question. I mean, I talk all day with you, but I know you've got important. No, no, you tell me. That's the ones that's most important to you all, and I, I can give you the well, let me quick ask answers. This. I mean, all eyes in the country, frankly, sir, are on Joe Manchin because you know, you're a straight, uh, straight talking, uh, transparent senator who wants to find solutions across lines. And, and some of these issues in the past have all been party line votes, and now it's 50-50. So everybody's looking at Joe Manchin. You're one of only three senators. I think you, Senator Tester, and... Oh, Mr. Cinema. Uh, so, uh, no, who who are in states where Trump won? Oh my goodness! Okay. Yeah, states, yeah, myself, uh, uh, John Tester. That he wins he wins my state bigger than any other states. Yeah. Oh, and Sherrod Brown. That's right. Sherrod Brown yeah, in Ohio. Right. So yeah. my question, really, I mean, obviously taxes are a big part of, and were a big part of, of uh, now President Biden's campaign. And how do you see? How do you, I would imagine you differ a little bit on some of these tax matters. Sure. Uh, how do you see that going? Where do you, where are your priorities? What are you going to be looking for? What's your test going to be? You know be? what, before, I, and, and we, when we were, we were really working closely with the Trump administration when they were moving on this tax reform. And I went to the White House and said, Mr. President, he wanted to go to 15% corporate. We were at 35. I said, Mr. President, I, I don't think there's a, there's a CEO in America that wouldn't be tickled to death with a 25% corporate rate, a 10% cut. Be tremendous. Level the playing field out. Do away with a lot of the, the things that we don't think that are needed anymore. A lot of the tax credits that shouldn't be extended, always just for the sake, because we've done it before. Look at some really, and make sure that these, the tax overhaul that we do is helping everybody. It's helping everybody. And uh, uh, so... I'm looking and we're looking reevaluating our staff is reevaluating what we proposed back in 2017. We'll look at basically what has been done and where carried interest is one. I think that everyone recognized it should be done away with and it wasn't. And it should have been, I think every, I think all the presidents ran on it, didn't they? Democrat and Republican. Most likely. Yeah. Yeah. But some of those things, there are some things that we can. But yeah. the I think, line, you know, a lot from our perspective, we've always had as a kind of a guiding light, you know, we don't, we don't really, we don't want subsidies and we don't want to be penalized and we want these assets to be taxed yeah. fairly. And, but we I do watch the capital gains. Everyone's concerned about capital gains. We understand yes, that. We're going to be watching all that 
you cannot, you cannot throw a rock into the middle of this economy right now and expect it's going to float. Yeah. You just can't do it, Jeff. On the other hand, there's some adjustments that can be made. I understand that President Biden wanted to go to 28. I would suggest probably looking at 25. We can go up to 28 if basically we see the economy is not being harmed. Okay. But if you go from 21 to 28, seven point jump could may basically throttle back some of it. Because I think we got pent up demand that's going to take off like a rocket. If it does, then you can look and make some adjustments accordingly. But we also, we've got to be able to maintain the debt structure of $28 trillion and growing. I mean, it's just unreal. And on that, there's to be discipline. You just can't throw caution to the wind. And that's from both sides. I think it makes a lot of sense, sir. And I, on, on the capital gain issue, you know, forget about the number, what it is, but a lot of people's views, and I think it's our view, is that as long as there is a differential and incentive to put capital at risk to create sure. jobs, that's what you really yeah. want. And the other thing on some of these changes in the past, you know, and you mentioned carried interest, and I'm sure there will be activity there and so forth, but how that is dealt with- Carried interest on, is not going to fix the budget problems. Yeah, but yeah. It's, it's, just, it's, just, it's a bad optic. Right. It is. And, and but retroactive stuff and going forward, there's a lot of details in there that will are very important. And we're, we look forward to talking with you ab mm -hmm. about that um, on energy. You're the chairman now of the Energy mm -hmm. and Natural Resources Committee. Holy cow. Does anyone in West Virginia care about that? I mean, well, they should. But here's the thing. Only thing Jeff, I asked everybody that comes and visits with me. I said, do you believe the United States of America should be energy independent? That tells me that maybe we're on the same page or maybe we're not. If you say, yes, we are. And I said, we're fine. And we can do it cleaner than ever before. We can lead the world in innovation through technology. We can lead the world with the newest technology. And I've said, you can't eliminate your way to a cleaner environment. You can uh, innovate your way to a cleaner environment. But if you're thinking about global climate, not just North American climate or United States climate, and what we've got to do is we've got to use everything we have, every tool in the toolbox. Uh, we've got countries right now that are using uh, first-generation coal-fired plants. Well, hell, we've eliminated all that in the United States. We're up to second, third, fourth generation, and we can go even more. How do we get the rest of the world to use it? How do we get India to use the scrubbers, low knocks, boilers, bag houses for mercury? Uh, and so anything I've said on that is you have to use your trading. You have to use the, the strength of your economy and your market to give people caveats that they'll use the newest technology that, that we've already developed. And we should be basically the, the world leader in manufacturing and distributing technology for environmental cleanup, whether it be with coal-fired plants, whether it be natural gas and uh, methane capturing, whether it be basically oil and production and use of oil. But we're not going to eliminate them. And we're going to basically innovate them. And that's what I have said. So I think people pretty much, hopefully they know, uh, and there's some people that agree and people that disagree with me on that, but we'll see if we do it. If we do it truly. I, I, like, I, I, I really like your comment about you can, you can't eliminate your way, but you can innovate, innovate. your way. You can innovate your way. Yeah. And you know, buildings just, I would like you Same to way. In, in, in your mind, just buildings and building stock and so forth and the energy that the tenants of buildings use and we certainly want to be a part and you and i have well, the building jeff where we need help on that on the last energy bill we had uh you know gene shaheen and rob yeah. portman teamed up for uh for energy efficiency yep. and the building codes is where we run into trouble we always run into problem there we've got to get past that there are certain things that can be done and should be done that's a low-hanging fruit energy efficiency and this was optional it wasn't mandatory but they were just afraid and it's just it's left a sour taste in everybody's mouth that we can't get past that. And yeah, the builder no, building no. association is basically the builders are always opposing that. Yeah. The, the home building world, home you building. Know, world, yeah. you, you may not recall, you, there's no reason for you to, but it's a, it was, it's a, it's a, in my mind, because it was a great thing to be asked, but I was at a press conference with you, Senator right. Portman, Senator Shaheen on that bill. And we do support those voluntary changes and we want to be a partner 
markets, the markets are going to demand it, Jeff. The markets will demand it. And let the market, I want the market to drive me where I need to be and I'll get there as quick as I can. I want the market to help me. I don't want basically political philosophy or ideology drive me to an area that basically we don't have the technology to do what you want, but it's what you want to do. So basically you create a lot of hardship on people because we're not prepared to take care of the problem. That's the difference. Senator, you're singing our tune and, uh, and we very much appreciate uh, being with you today. Well, thank and, you. And you've got, you, you always have a big job and you have a bigger job now because again, everyone really is looking at you as, as a decider, as a leader, as a someone that, and, and whenever we can be of help, however the real estate industry writ large or the round table in particular can partner with you uh, We'd love to. You're doing a great job with the No Labels group. We're very supportive yeah, of that. They've been good. And, uh, please. Let me just say this, if I can, Jeffrey and Michelle and all of you all there. Let me just say that on this, um, my decision to be based on what I can go home and explain it. I've always said that. That's the common sense. It doesn't matter whether it's a Democrat or Republican issue. It doesn't matter whether it's a party line vote or whatever it may be or whatever they think it may be. If it doesn't make sense and I can't go home and explain it to my to my constituents in West Virginia, I can't support it. So it's pretty common sense that, hey, I'm not gonna blow up this Senate. I guess the seat I'm setting in is Robert C. Byrd. If they think I'm gonna pull the trigger and get rid of the filibuster where it was intended for the minority to have input, we better start making the place work. Let's start having lunches together. Let's start having dinners. Let's start basically building relationships again. Try that on first before you blow the place up. So if they think I'm gonna pull that nuclear option, I'm not doing it. Now, that puts me in a unique position because there's only one other Democrat has said that, is that's Kirsten Cinema. right now. So the bottom line is we haven't even been able to organize. And I've told the whole world I'm not blowing it up, so there shouldn't be anything holding back. Let's organize. Let's start doing our job and start working like Americans and not like Democrats and Republicans. I'm going to try everything I can to make the place work. And I'm going to try to heal the country the same as Joe Biden's trying to heal it. And we're going to work in a bipartisan fashion. That's that's the Democrats' response. I mean, that's the Senate's responsibility. And Democrats being in the majority, it's their responsibility to lead through bipartisanship, not by sheer power. Do you want to give a forecast or at all on the timing of the impeachment and how long it might last or any comment? The impeachment there? will be pretty quick. I mean, what they're talking about, I don't think they're bringing witnesses in. So I think you're, I think more than a week would be, uh, no more than a week would be my guess. Yeah. Well, again, thank you so much. Okay. And, uh, be Let's keep well. in touch, Jeff. Anytime, I can, anytime we can talk or any of your, put, put a round table together, happy to do it. All right, sir. Okay. Have a, have a great day, sir. And Thank you, my friend. Good work. Thank you. Bye-bye.